righty. So tonight is our sixth session of the AO North America Link uh, seminar. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about ankle fractures, a very common injury. Uh, so listen close. Just a reminder, AO and A Link, what we're all about. There are four pillars, listening, integrating, networking, and knowledge, as we hope to set you up for really successful orthopedic careers moving forward. As always, we really appreciate the support that we get for this program from the AO North America leadership from Dr. Rout, who gave us some excellent advice when he tuned in earlier in the uh, series. And then Dr. Aker is joining us yet again tonight. And he uh, gave a great piece of advice about how the importance of the foundation of knowledge, which we help, hope to help you build this evening. As always, Dr. Mitchell is the right-hand man tonight. He's on the clickety-clacks, ready to answer all your uh, pressing questions. And if you don't remember me, I'm Taylor Young. I'm in El Paso, Texas. And we've got a really excellent guest with us tonight, Dr. Malcolm Devon. He is at Duke University, and he's the orthopedic trauma director there. Malcolm, tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, do you have any advice for our students as they gear up for interview season? Awesome. Thanks, uh, Dr. Young. So first off, so honored and thankful to be here. Um, the AO has been really tremendous. It's a part of my education and experience. And, you know, I remember first being engaged as a resident and y'all are so lucky to get engaged even earlier than that. So uh, really dive in and, and this is the start of a, a great experience in your career. Um, so, yeah, I'm at, I'm at uh, Duke, uh, third year in practice, trained on the West Coast. Um, and I just want to offer y'all just a little snippet of advice for when you're interviewing for your residencies. Um, you know, it's interview season. I know that's on the front of your own mind right now. So, um, you know, be yourself, right? Like you really want to be genuine. You also want to be professional, but also show your personality. So it's always a balance. It's a little bit of a dichotomy there, but you, you do want to get to know your future colleagues and mentors and um and treat everybody well with respect and enjoy it so i would say that and uh we can kind of move along thanks that's excellent advice so we've come a long way we're about halfway there tonight we're talking about ankle fractures just a reminder there uh the ao would also like to let you know about a new program coming out that uh, will help you along your pathway to surgical proficiency and that's the AO Milestones program. So be on the lookout for more information about that. and Check out uh, some more info at the link provided here. And just a reminder, keep asking questions. You guys have been asking really, really excellent questions. We appreciate all the engagement. It helps everybody learn. So stay active and, and don't be shy. Keep asking. Dr. Mitchell's ready to answer them. Uh, don't forget to get your badge and to watch on YouTube later. All right, so quick recap from last month, we talked about hip fractures and with hip fractures, there are many important considerations, but the thing we wanted to stress the most to you was understanding how location factors into some of the decisions we make. And so it's really important to start to distinguish between what's a femoral neck fracture and what's an intertrochal fracture because we kind of call them all hip fractures. Uh, and one of the important distinctions is what's an intracapsular or within the capsule injury versus an extra capsular or outside the capsule injury. And then once you think about intracapsular injuries, where along the neck is that occurring? As you move down the femoral neck, we start with a subcapital fracture, then we go to a transcervical fracture, and then below that is a basi cervical fracture. And those are important as we talk about treating those injuries. And then we also reviewed the garden classification where non-displaced injuries are labeled ones and twos, and then displaced injuries are labeled threes and fours. And then in, this is a classification that we typically use in talking about geriatric or elderly hip fractures. And so those that are non-displaced will often undergo some form of fixation, while those that are displaced will typically get some form of arthroplasty. We also reviewed intertrochanteric femur fractures. And in this case, we're really concerned about what makes the fracture stable or unstable. And those unstable injuries include poster medial comminution, lateral wall extension, and subtroch extension. And then there's another type that is a reverse obliquity pattern. And those all indicate unstable intertroch fractures that are better 
treated with a cephalomedullary nail as opposed to a sliding hip screw type construct. And then as we tr take care of hip fracture patients, we see them commonly, uh, but they can be complex patients. And so uh, we really want you to understand how the goals impact the treatment decisions. And so we really are trying to get patients up and moving with weight bearing as tolerated as early as possible. And that is part of what underlies the decision in terms of how we treat their fractures. And the goals there are to minimize surgical morbidity, treating each patient uh, based on the patient and not just the fracture, and then you choosing to perform the safest operation that has the lowest risk of reoperation. And then you also have to be really important as you talk to the care team, uh, the patient's family, because expectation management is important because mobility can change after these surgeries. And then it's a, a truly multidisciplinary approach where we rely on our medicine colleagues, geriatricians, and then considering bone health afterwards as patients may need to start bisphosphonates or other medications to hopefully prevent future fragility fractures. All the while, we continue to lean on our AO principles of anatomic reduction, stable internal fixation, preservation of the soft tissues as much as possible, including the blood supply, and then early active and pain-free mobilization, as these are the foundation of what we do in orthopedic trauma. Tonight, the learning objectives are listed below. We really want to hit hard the things that are going to impact ankle stability, and that's the bony and ligamentous anatomy, and then help you begin to understand how those things correlate to the imaging that we're utilizing in identifying and thinking about these injuries, both preoperatively and operatively or during surgery, and then touching on how we can utilize mechanical principles to fix them, but also to understand what sort of things we expect to be injured as part of the fracture. And then I would just say, underestimate ankle fractures at your own peril because they are common and can uh, easily go um, undertreated or uh, misinterpreted. And part of that issue is that it's a really a, a, an incredible spectrum of injury uh, and you can sort of see some of those examples here, ranging from mild fractures to extremely severe fractures. So the first thing we want to touch on is that anatomy. And so the real key here is that the, the stability of the ankle is determined by both bony uh, attachment, bony uh, anatomy, and then the ligamentous attachments. And so the bony stability of the ankle is provided by the malleoli, which are bony projections that form sort of a, a hole or a recess in which the talus sits. And so the fibula is the lateral malleolus and the tibia contains the medial and posterior malleoli that form that uh, project to that keyhole that the talus sits underneath. And then the ligamentous uh, anatomy that contributes to stability includes the syndesmosis or sometimes called the inferior tibiofibular complex. But more commonly, we just say syndesmosis. And then there are lateral ligaments and medial ligaments that are important to the stability as well. So the bony anatomy, just to kind of hit that home here, the lateral malus is uh, highlighted in blue here at the fibula. And the posterior malleolus is noted here posteriorly on the screen that's uh, the posterior aspect of the ankle. And uh, sort of further into the image is the medial malleolus here. And you can see a direct AP view that highlights those as well. So those are going to be important because these ligamentous attachments insert there. And so the syndesmosis includes multiple components, the interosseous membrane, which is labeled with the one here, and then the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, or sometimes called the AITFL, labeled two, and then the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, PITFL, labeled eight here. And so these attach to important bony components of the ankle. The lateral ligament complex, like we talked about prior, includes these structures as well. The anterior talofibular ligament, it's important to make that distinction and it can be confusing, uh, but the ATFL, the calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament, these make up that lateral ligamentous complex. And then medially, we're primarily talking about the deltoid ligament, which uh, uh, stabilize the medial side of the ankle. 
So just to kind of rehash that a little bit in a different way, uh, we have uh, the bony anatomy inserted here, and then we've drawn on some of the ligamentous attachments, the AITFL here connecting the anterior portion of the tibia to the fibula, and then the PITFL from the posterior view that can be appreciated, the deltoid on the medial side of the ankle, and then the lateral ligamentous structures here, the CFL and the ATFL, or the calcaneofibular ligament and the anterior talofibular ligament. These are some of the important ligamentous uh, components that really contribute to the stability of the ankle along with the bony anatomy. And so when we begin to think about these injuries in the emergency room, what we're usually getting is x-rays because we can't see the ligaments. We can only see the bones. And so it's important to understand both. There was an excellent quote from AO Principles of Fracture Management included here that really hits home this concept that ligament complexes do not appear on the x-rays. And so the surgeon needs to be able to diagnose ligamentous injuries from the fracture pattern to fully understand the anatomy of the injury. And to do that, we utilize these x-rays here. Typically, we get a three-view series of x-rays, which include the mortise on the left, the lateral in the middle, and the AP on the right. Um, and so we utilize these to understand the injuries and treat them appropriately. The mortise view shown here is a basically an AP view taken with 15 to 20 degrees of internal rotation. And that allows us to see uh, the space and the plafond here as a nice arc. And we'll sort of draw some of that out for you in a second. Uh, but you can see here the fibula is outlined in orange, the tibia in green, and the talus in yellow here. And I want you to sort of, uh, in your mind's eye, picture the ligamentous anatomy here on the right sort of overlaid onto that x-ray to get a sense of where those important ligaments are attaching. We also utilize various radiographic clues to understand what's normal and what's abnormal. And this helps us uh, discern if we have one restored normal anatomy during fixation, or if the injury is associated with instability based on disruption of some of these measurements. So one of the things we look at is an appropriate amount of overlap between the tibia and the fibula labeled in orange, as well as this clear space between the two labeled in green. And then we also look at the clear space medially in the shoulder area. And then uh, the dime sign is a circular marker that appears distal to the fibula and can be useful in determining a, a length relationship. Shenton's line is a line drawn that should be nice and smooth that runs along the plafond uh, in the articular portion of the, the ankle there. The lateral x-ray is incredibly important as well, but can sometimes be difficult to interpret because of the the fact that the bones are overlying each other so much. And so here it's helpful to see how uh, the bones are outlined in, in orange for the fibula, green for the tibia, and yellow for the talus once more. Uh, and sometimes it's harder to see, but the medial malleolus projects distally from that arc of the green uh, tibia there. Um, and then you can get a sense of two important uh, eponyms that we utilize uh, to describe the bony anatomy, where the PITFL attaches posterior at the Volkman fragment, which is the posterior malleolus where the PITFL ligament attaches. Anteriorly, the Chaput fragment uh, is where the AITFL inserts. And these are eponyms that you may hear frequently in your trauma conferences. So that was a lot. Are there any uh, questions that have come up real quick, Phil? Nothing, we're good to keep this train rolling. Perfect. Uh, so the first case here is a case that you submitted, Malcolm. Uh, it's a nice uh, case that illustrates some of these points that we talked about. This is a, the 51-year-old lady who had the ground level fall. When you have an uh, x-ray like this or an injury like this, how do you like your, your students to describe this image for you in conference? And is there is there a classification system that you guys talk about with these injuries? Perfect. Well, yeah, so this was my patient. So, you know, if I was a trainee describing this x-ray in conference, um, I would state that you see two views of the left ankle and mortise in a lateral view, demonstrating a short oblique transsynosmotic distal fibula fracture uh, with some potential tibia translation uh, with respect to the um, the talus. So um, we'll we'll kind of talk a little bit more, but I think that uh, this is one of these fractures that you do need to get a stress exam 
Um, and just in terms of the Weber classification, you know, you have these three types of fibular fractures that really kind of uh, organize our thinking with respect to the injury mechanism and treatment. So you have an infrasynosmotic fibular fracture, a Weber A, uh, transsynosmotic fibular fracture, Weber B, which is what you saw at the prior image, and a suprasynosmotic or a high fibular fracture, Weber C. So if you take a look back at the um, image of our uh, injury, uh, you can see this is a Weber B transsynosmotic fibular fracture, where we indicate Excellent. we indicate a um, a stress test. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, we we typically are getting stress exams for these as well uh, to ensure that uh, sometimes you can have a stable injury, but in this case, uh, a potentially unstable injury. Uh, the stress view is typically performed by getting a, a good mort mortise X-ray and then uh, making sure you dorsiflex the foot, uh, or excuse me, dorsiflex the ankle, and then provide an external rotation stress uh, to the foot to assess for instability, which is indicated, like you said, by the Taylor shift, uh, the uh, medial clear space widening, uh, changes in some of those radiographic parameters that we discussed. Um, does everybody do a manual stress? Anybody do gravity stress or no stress at all? You know, for you me, guys do? It, it's just such an important test. You know, this is really determining whether a patient can be weight barriers tolerated in a boot and not undergo a surgery versus a surgical indication. So I prefer to take that matter into our own hands and our team and do a manual stress comparatively to maybe a gravity. But if the patient is walking, I would say, you know, on this ankle fracture and then they've kind of naturally stressed it. So, um, you know, I would take that as a, as a reasonable um, uh, information to determine op versus non-op management without a manual stress. Yeah, the next thing to discuss, perhaps, Taylor, I mean, it gets, you can get really into the weeds here. I mean, no, for sure. <laughs> some, some of these stress tests are very obvious and the patients are very uncomfortable. Some patients, you'll stress them and they, it doesn't really hurt. And maybe they have this x ray that y'all are showing here. I mean, you, you could very objectively say that the medial clear space is a little bit wider. But, Taylor, I wonder if I stress your ankle. Are you, if I push hard enough, is there a little bit of physiologic widening? I mean, you start to get into some of these gray areas where you don't want to over indicate patients for operations, but you certainly don't want to miss things either. So this one looks like this is a soft positive from, from my standpoint, but it's definitely not that if a patient is super sick on dialysis, really opposed to having surgery, you know, this is one I might put them in a Quigley, get it well reduced and uh, wait it out. You know, this is this is a tweener, but a little bit on the positive spectrum. Is this your patient still, Malcolm? Yes, sir. Yeah. So what did you think here? So we, we discussed with uh, with her kind of through a shared decision making process of, you know, we do see some lateral tailor shift. It is mild. Um, we do meet operative indications if she's interested and assumes the risk of surgery. And she really wanted to have her anatomy restored. So she underwent uh, operative fixation for this. So you can see, this is what we did. So um, this was our construct here. So we did a, a direct approach to the fibula through a posterior lateral approach and uh, clamp reduction, holding wires. Those are some of the steps you don't see on the furrows, but Ultimately, we chose to use a one-third tubular plate that's uh, fashioned uh, to be a posterior lateral plate when in uh, anti-glide um, mode to resist uh, vertical shear of that uh, short oblique fibular fracture. And you can see on the right, because we tried to use kind of minimum amount of fixation for maximum stability, we wanted to test to make sure we had sufficient stability. So we use what is called a uh, cotton test, um, where we put a clamp on the fibula and try to um, really translate the fibula with respect to the talus and the tibia. And we see we restore stability of the ankle there. Would you do anything different with that one, Dr. Aker? 
or to use a similar construct? Well, I guess, are these the finals that were, did you put no fixation into the little distal fibular nugget? Yes, sir. I was trying to prove a point to my trainees that this was necessary and sufficient. And those are the final films after she's been weight bearing on it. Yeah, that's a, it's a ele very elegant construct, I might add. However, in Houston, most of our patients are three to 400 pounds and they walk early. So we like robust fixation. So this is elegant, but I probably would have put a longer plate, more screws in the distal block, um, potentially even a lag screw, if it, like your image on the right there, um, if the pattern was laggable. Um, lag screw with a neutralization plate. Um, but this is beautiful. Can't argue with this. Yeah, I think you hit some of the nice points there that it is, a, it is optimizing mechanics to treat the fracture with minimal implants, but maintaining maximal stability. And so here you can see the anti-glide principle applied with that screw that is applied sort of in that axilla. Uh, and then also in this diagram, you see that lag screw that you mentioned as well. And we talked about that uh, in the implants lecture in month two. Uh, if you are able to go to this link, that link at some point in time uh, on the AO surgery reference site, there's a really excellent video that walks you through the whole idea of this neutralization plate application. So that was a great case uh, showing some really important principles. This one's a bit different. Um, how, how do you think about this one differently, Malcolm? Yeah, I can take this one. This was my case. So 47-year-old um, male misstepped and twisted his ankle. And you see here on his injury, AP, well, really a mortise and lateral, a um, supersynosmotic or Weber C fibular fracture with clearly some lateral Taylor shift with respect to the uh, tibia. And so this is one of those injury patterns that to me is operative and doesn't require a stress test to indicate a patient for a surgery. You have instability of the tibial Taylor joint almost by definition of the injury and mechanism. So what you do here is, you know- can I, Malcolm, can I just interrupt just to uh, play devil's advocate because your house staff did a wonderful job of splinting this patient. The image on the right is nearly anatomic. So. Can we get Big Phil in the game, Dr. Mitchell? This looks wonderful. So why, why is this an operative ankle fracture? I mean, the, the X-ray on the right, okay, uh, it looks wonderful. The X-ray on the left, it's displaced. The X-ray on the right, anatomy, the position has been re restored. So why surgery for this? Yeah, I think one important uh, concept for ankle fractures is. Uh, there, uh, for from an operative standpoint, sometimes there's not an absolute indication. So for this, certainly can treat it non-operatively in the patient if it, if it's a patient who fulfills those criteria. And so, what I'm thinking about is the uh, diabetic uh, with elephantiasis with skin that I don't want to cut through. Um, absolutely, if you can maintain the ankle mortise to union, uh, in in my mind that that fulfills non-operative criteria. I think in this situation where there is a concern for syndesmotic disruption in a patient who you want to rehab early, move their ankle, get, you know, get them on a, a pathway um, to relatively normal function. I think it's, it's a discussion, but you'll, you'll encounter patients who say, I, I don't want surgery. And that's fine. It just means that they're probably going to be coming back to see me in clinic every week, every two weeks. We're going to make sure their ankle stays reduced. As that talus starts to drift a millimeter, one millimeter, the forces across that joint go up 50%. And so I have a couple of cases of patients where even just with a millimeter, you can see that ankle uh, fall apart, go on to arthritis. So if you can maintain it, can treat it closed, not up. Um, but I think some of these two are a little bit of a dynamic process, and this may have more instability uh, than you realize. So that's awesome. I think that's one of the good take-home points for the students is that we we toss around this term instability. Oh, it's an unstable pattern. Well, 
in my mind, if I was a student, well, all fractures are unstable. I mean, there there's two pieces of bone flopping around. So, um, but when we are referencing instability about an ankle, in general, I think of it as the the challenge or the inability to maintain a congruent ankle mortise. So, although that image on the right that Malcolm's residents did that reduction, it looks wonderful. Chances are in a couple of days or a week when they follow up, it's gonna look just like the X-ray on the left. It's probably, it's so unstable. It's gonna go right back to where it was. So yeah, I think one of the, thank you. No, no, that's excellent. I think you made a great point about their reduction and their mold, their Quigley maneuver to maintain that position uh, that helps mitigate some of those deforming forces. But I agree, you're right. Oftentimes the swelling goes away, that splint becomes more loose and then there's a little bit more movement in there too. And so, uh, so yeah, that, that does make things challenging to both attain, but also maintain that, that reduction that we're talking about. And so this injury was a bit different. Like we said, we were talking about the height of that fibula fracture. This one is not a Weber A, it's not a Weber B, but it's a Weber uh, C fracture with a higher fibula fracture above the level of that syndesmosis. And then there's this little piece here uh, that seems to probably uh, indicate an important ligamentous injury. Uh, which I think uh, you addressed when you fixed the fracture. Uh, but as we talked about before, and we think back to our anatomy slides, there's a, the AITFL inserts in this area. And that may be a very, very small put fragment. Uh, and so what was your strategy when you uh, took this patient to the OR, Malcolm? Yeah, thanks, Taylor. So we, uh, we recognized that small but very meaningful avulsion of the AITFL. And so um, we, you know, knew that our synosmosis was going to be injured, and we had planned on potentially doing an open reduction and assessment of the synosmosis. So, but to do that first, we really wanted to get contralateral films to understand what our mortise, but also sometimes more importantly, our lateral X-ray looks like, um, so you can understand that posterior tip fib overlap. And then we did a direct approach to the fibula. Um, and clamp reduction with maintaining that with wires, then use a one-third stacked uh, tubular plate to provide our fixation of the fibula. And then um, we did a small kind of distal interlateral approach to the insatura and saw that little avulsion of the AITFL and directly repaired that back to its insertion uh, using this uh, suture anchor. It was too small to re repair originally with uh, with a screw or a plate. Um, and then that helped really provide provisionally some um, obta um, obtaining a reduction of the synosmosis with able to tensioning off the AITFL that we repaired. So then we chose a clamp, a very careful vector to uh, clamp our synosmosis in the insusura. And then I'd like to fix the synosmosis with a synosmotic screw in rigid fixation. So here's our final construct. And so when, when you were fixing this, uh, I probably didn't show it in all the florals that you sent, but you uh, are you testing the instability after each stage of your, your fixation process? or um, were you thinking of putting that screw regardless? You know, I think kind of to your point earlier, um, you know, understanding your radiograph and your injury films, we kind of know that the synosmosis is injured. And so um, I was committed to fixing the synosmosis um, after fixing the fibula. Uh, we could have done an academic kind of um, experience of doing an external rotation stress test after fixing the fibula, but to me, I know the ATFO is injured. I know the synosmosis had to be injured for the fibular fracture to have been fractured above it. So um, we're going to reduce and fix it. Right. There are a few questions, Taylor, if you'll stay on that side, that I think are really uh, good and probably a good yeah. address it. So the first one, Philip, great name, asks, uh, why not just get an MRI to assess ligamentous structures like we do for ACL, PCL injuries to have a definitive answer? I think that's an awesome question. And, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about the bony anatomy and then also the ligaments. The, uh, the reason we don't in a lot of these is first cost is a consideration, but secondly, from the exam that 
Malcolm got on this case, he knew what was injured, if that makes sense. And commonly you'll hear during a surgery, you'll say, okay, let's do the stress. Let's do the cotton test. Let's do the experimentation stress to assess if there's ligament injury in that case. So that that's uh, to answer that one. Then Reese asked, is it beneficial to repair ligamentous structures? I think that's um, a, a great question as well. Incredibly hard to answer because of the variety of ligaments and the variety of injuries. So to use the syndesmosis as an example here, uh, in this case, there was an avulsion that was able to be repaired. Commonly, there's not. And there's just syndesmotic injury and the AITFL and the PITFL are both disrupted. There is cost to repairing structures as well. So to approach it from the front and the back to repair those two ligaments, whereas ligaments can scar down and heal if they're in the right anatomic location. So sometimes what you will see, and there's some practice variability with this too, is repair of the deltoid ligament specifically. And we're not going to dive too deep into that. But let's say Malcolm fixed this fibula and then he stressed the ankle and the talus didn't translate. The syndesmosis wasn't disrupted, but there was a lot of tilt and it was clear the deltoid was injured. I've opened those cases before and repaired that ligament. So um, that, that those are both excellent uh, questions. Any other thoughts from the panel on those, those two ligamentous questions? I think... Um... The only thing I'd say is MRI is just not feasible in all systems. Like we have a very long wait list for MRI in El Paso. So that that's maybe one other consideration that I would say. It seems like uh, an awful lot of emergency room physicians have a kind of a knee jerk to imaging, imaging, imaging. But I'll just remind all the students, as well as my colleagues, that uh, sometimes examining a patient, yes, that means touching the patient, actually can reveal an awful lot of information. In fact, sometimes more than an MRI will give you. So don't forget about the physical exam. That's a, that's a really important point for sure. <laughs> and so uh, as we move along, uh, one of the things we wanted to consider also is how the mechanism plays a role in this process. And so uh, typically when you injure your ankle, your foot is either in a supinated position or a pronated position as shown here. And this is important because it uh, results in the fibula fracture being at a certain uh, height, which is a, a good way to start to think about things as we stratify them into a bit of an algorithm. And so with a supinated foot, typically you're going to see a relatively low fibula fracture, either a Weber A below the syndesmosis or a Weber B at the level of the syndesmosis. Whereas in the pronated foot, you're probably going to see a higher fibula fracture above the level of the syndesmosis. And then typically we're dividing those into two different uh, camps. One is a simple fracture that's either oblique or spiral, uh, and the other is one that is more transverse and often comminuted. The next level up is as uh, in terms of how mechanism impacts a fracture is what happens uh, to the foot in terms of the force di uh, directed onto the ankle after it's in either that supinated or pronated position. So this is uh, an example that really shows that well. And uh, so this patient is a 31 year old female who's in a motor vehicle collision, which is in, in my mind, a bit of a higher energy mechanism than those others described. And so how is this one different from those others, uh, Malcolm? Yeah, so this was, uh, I think maybe my one of my last cases, but um... So yeah, as you mentioned, a higher speed mechanism, not necessarily a rotational ankle injury, but a varus producing, varus producing uh, vector causing a um, vertical shear fracture dislocation of the medial malleolus, as well as a Weber A or low uh, fibular fracture. Um, so this is something that, um, you know, should alert us a bit more to a sense of urgency or examining the patient and um, understanding the conditions of the soft tissues. You can see possibly with that amount of displacement that there may be an open injury associated with this radiograph. Um, and we'll kind of touch upon that, I think a little bit more with the further imaging, but first step is examining the patient, um, making sure they're nerve vascularly intact. If there's an open injury, making sure they have IV antibiotics and tetanus. 
um, and then putting a, a, a soft sterile dressing over the wound um, and then doing a reduction maneuver, which you can see is going to be different because to resist this deformity, you actually need to provide a laterally translational force to the hind foot uh, to prevent the varus. So understanding your injury pattern will help you manage this, um, this injury in the ED. So here you see, this is a supination abduction. Well, at the prior image, you saw that's a supination abduction ankle fracture. So for me, those ankle fractures are kind of on a spectrum of um, more higher energy. So they get a CT scan because I really want to look for impaction uh, on the medial shoulder and not miss that because we need to address that surgically. And then you could tell that there was some air on the CT scan. So that was an open injury. So for this case, uh, this was uh, temporizing the ED the night before. Make sure we kept those IV antibiotics running. And then this was a first start case the next day. Uh, this patient had a transverse wound on the lateral aspect of her ankle. And that was the tension failure side because you had a Weber A, ankle, a fibula fracture there. Uh, so the fibula failed in tension. And we elected to, after we IND'd it, uh, directly reduce that and place a tension band plate uh, on the lateral column. Close that definitively even though it was an open ankle injury because we were confident in our debris mount and there was no gross contamination. So definitive primary closure and then elected to move along to the medial aspect of the ankle. So direct approach to the uh, medial malleolus. And it's really a kind of an anterior medial approach because I want to make sure that I visualize the medial shoulder um, of, the, um, of the ankle. There wasn't any impaction in this particular injury, so we did a clamp reduction of the vertical shear medial malleolus and then elected to fix with a buttress plate, because this is a partial articular fracture, a B-type fracture, with first placing our axillary screw just proximal to the fracture, uh, screw um, proximal to that to hold anterior rotation, and then a lag screw across the fracture perpendicular to it. So that was our, our final construct. Yeah, I think that's a, a really nice, elegant construct once more. Utilizing that tension band plate uh, is a, a nice strategy there. Um, and uh, really indicating that you, you did a really thorough debridement before you fix things. I think that's an important idea as well. So, uh, and uh, like we talked about in month two, utilizing that uh, buttressing type plate to address the partial articular injury. Uh, so in this supination adduction type injury, you can see here how the energy progresses through and causes disruption of the fibula first, and then progresses to the medial side as the talus AD ducts translating medially, impacting that shoulder and causing that vertical medial malleolus fracture and, and some of that articular impaction. And so uh, this is sort of a nice segue into the Loggy Hansen classification system, which is another uh, classification scheme that you might hear mentioned in your trauma conferences. And so there are four general types of injuries. Uh, the supination adduction, like we talked about prior, a supination external rotation, uh, both of these supination type injuries, like we talked about, lower fibula fractures, uh, and then two other uh, types, uh, the pronation extra rotation, the pronation abduction. So two with higher fibula fractures, one that is simple in the extra rotation type, the simple spiral fracture, and the comminuted transverse fracture in the abduction type. And so these are commonly talked about in your trauma conferences, so good to be aware of. This is a 59-year-old female who had a twist and fall. This is a uh, uh, a patient here who has uh, three views of the ankle. You can see there's a uh, fibula fracture sort of at the level of the syndesmosis, a uh, medial malleolus fracture. And then if you look closely at the lateral x-ray, there's something going on posteriorly along the tibia as well. And so this represents what we call the supination external rotation type ankle injury, which uh, begins with that short oblique uh, fibula fracture, it's sort of spiral in nature. And then uh, as that fibula fracture displaces and the talus externally rotates, you get uh, this disruption of the PITFL or the posterior malleolus uh, fracture. And then on the medial side, you get either a deltoid ligament disruption like Dr. Mitchell mentioned or this uh, medial malleolus fracture. And so 
Uh, the patient is once again provisionally splinted in the emergency room with a nice mold. Although to be critical here, you might say, oh, they're in a little bit of plantar flexion. We like to get a little more dorsiflexion, at least to neutral here in that splint. And so uh, probably the resident got a little, uh, uh, maybe only mildly chastised for that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it's really excellent reduction overall and uh, maintaining reasonable alignment until we are able to address them surgically, which may happen that day or in uh, once the soft tissues uh, have settled and allow us to. Uh, so here, uh, I'm just going to run through this one really quickly. We addressed each component of the injury where there was instability, essentially. And so we began by addressing the posterior malleolus first with a buttressing type plate, addressing that posterior malleolus fracture. We also utilized that anti-glide plate that uh, Malcolm mentioned here with the fibula. Uh, and then we fix the medial malleolus after that with a uh, partially threaded cannulated screw, which we learned in month two is a lag by design screw. So we restored the anatomy of the ankle and theoretically the stability there. Uh, and if we're, we didn't uh, put us in asthmatic screw, but theoretically we've stabilized all those ligamentous components that we think are injured. Anybody uh, do anything differently for an injury like this? similar constructs yeah to me i mean it looks fantastic i i like the sequence too some folks i guess would potentially reduce and fix the fibula first but i like to get the articular injury correct at the the volkman so um i do that first i don't tend to have too much trouble getting that out to length even with the unreduced fibula yeah i think uh for me too i just i have trouble visualizing the articular surface as well if i fix the fibula so that's sort of my thought process there as well. Uh, to jump into another case real quick, case five is the case from last month where we talked about a little teaser here. Uh, we can see that this is a high fibula fracture, so, so we should already be starting to think about a pronation injury. There's a medial malleolus fracture as well, and the ankle is frankly dislocated, and the syndesmosis is very wide, so definitely a violent injury. To run through this mechanism just really quickly, it's a pronated uh, foot injury, and then the medial side fails first with a deltoid ligament or a medial malleolus fracture, and then the foot's externally rotating, and you injure the syndesmosis next anteriorly, and then the injury sort of progresses up in this uh, diagonal or lightning bolt-esque fashion here, uh, resulting in that high fibula fracture. Uh, so this was your case that you showed us last week, uh, Phil. What did you uh, What did you do for this one? Yes. So first, uh, we see the patient in the ED. This is a reduction that uh, when the resident looks at their consult list, this should probably go towards the top as I look at that medial skin that, you know, looks somewhat tinted. So this is a patient that takes priority. And so they get placed in a, uh, a splint, well-reduced splint. If their soft tissues are amenable to acute fixation, then they'll get fixed the next day. And so that looks like a fibula fracture that's a simple pattern, amenable for a lag screw and neutralization plate. I'd be planning my plate in such a way that syndesmotic screws could be placed at the bottom portion um, of that plate, given the concern for syndesmotic uh, instability. And so, so similar to the previous case, some cannulated screws were utilized, and then you see a syndesmotic screw. There were a couple of questions about types of syndesmotic fixation, which I think are excellent. You're going to see some differences among providers. For me, if they are a high energy ankle, this is a good example where it's a uh, very unstable syndesmosis. I typically will use screws to fix these high energy ankles just for the durability, the fixation, knowing that I want to maintain uh, this mortise to union. And then this patient, they asked about uh, do placing syndesmotic screws uh, create some stiffness in the ankle. This patient uh, did not break. Their syndesmotic screw did not loosen it, but did have some stiffness. I removed it at four months and um, actually had some improvement in range of motion. So it can uh, re result in that. I commonly tell patients that we're going to expect to either see loosening or breakage of the screw, and that is normal. Uh, you'll see sometimes two screws, sometimes one, sometimes all the way across all four, four uh, cortices, sometimes three. Uh, no, there's no literature that supports one of those specific um, styles of fixation, but he got back to skydiving. Uh, it was a good, it was a, it was a win. 
I'm curious uh, about practice patterns. So this is a very unstable ankle. It's it's well reduced in that splint, but uh, at, at your institutions, do you will you send that out, uh, or do you feel uneasy about sending that patient out based on that degree of instability? If their if their soft tissue envelope isn't amenable to surgery the next morning, sort of thing. Yeah, you know, no, for me, I think it was a. A, a great attempt at a reduction, but I think I would be very concerned about loss of reduction if we were to send that patient out. You already see the tail is starting to shift laterally, even in that splint. So I probably would try to manage this while as an inpatient. Just to really throw a wrench in all the plans. In Houston, we tend to X fix a lot of unstable ankles. Uh, so this patient based on the injury films and the amount of displacement and the fracture dislocation, likely instability about the mortise, probably depending on the swelling is gonna get a frame. It's unlikely that this would get fixed acutely. Probably would get an ankle external fixator sent home, follow up in clinic to be fixed the following week. Yeah, I think that's, that's common in, in our practice as well. Um, So just a quick recap before we dive into some other cases, uh, we talked about bony and ligamentous anatomy and how those are important to stability of the ankle and some of the important uh, structures are listed here and really just hitting home that point that the ligaments don't appear on the x-ray. So we need to be able to diagnose those uh, from our understanding of the anatomy and the bony attachments of those ligaments and their correlates on the x-ray. We talked about Weber classification and the low Weber A's, the Weber B's at the level of the syndesmosis and the high of Weber C's and how those help us think about how the uh, ankle was injured based on the mechanism. Uh, and Loggy Hansen adds into that the, the direction of the force with uh, uh, the SAD having a, a vertical medial malleolus, which I really want you to, to remember that. That's a common uh, question asked in morning trauma conferences. One thing I wanted to uh, put out there, maybe have a little group discussion about, is that uh, residents see a lot of ankle fractures every day, every night that they're on call. What, what's a resident doing that you think uh, really makes them excel as the consult resident when they're seeing ankle fracture consults? Well, I think, uh, you know, first really understanding your imaging and your injury films and having a uh, kind of level of uh, preclinical suspicion on how like acute this injury is and how prioritized you need to to make it to see the patient. So whether or not you have an open injury or you have a fracture dislocation where there could be some medial skin tinting um, or vascular compromise, like just kind of understanding the acuity and then just being very thorough about your history and physical and um, catching all the things that you need to know in order to really manage that patient. Then really, you know, focusing on your reduction and a nice well padded molded splint and getting appropriate imaging um, for the ones that may need a CT scan. Yeah, that's great. And so uh, any any thoughts on like tips, tricks, things that work well for you in the ER when you're trying to reduce an ankle and you don't have a lot of hands um, what sort of, what sort of the strategies there? Bend the knee. <laughs> Relax the gastro. Yeah. You yeah multiple, multiple, multiple people, you know, somebody to help hold the leg and then you got to hold the splint until it's completely hard. That's a common, uh, error that I've seen. You walk away. It's not quite hard enough. Extra comes in, they rotate the leg, the ankle dislocates at the back. So wait till it's completely hard. Um, when you're molding it as well, nice, smooth, uh, splint, you can tell a lot just from that post reduction about how competent the person who put the splint on, um, is, so. I got a question. Any other, oh yeah, 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 go ahead. Uh, that's what I was going to okay. say. Any other uh, questions? Just to pull the, uh, faculty here. So, you know, say you have a posterior fracture dislocation, trimalleolar fracture dislocation, large posterior malleolar component. Are you going to accept, um, maybe a little plantar flexion with that splint just to try to try to decrease the deforming forces on that dislocation? Or are we really kind of hardcore making sure that splint is in neutral? 
Uh, I, I had one of those recently and we did tolerate some plant our flexion and, uh, and then we, you know, we get a CT for operative planning sometimes in those and, uh, it was already subluxing. So then that person got an X fix the next morning, but overnight the plantar flexion was helpful to maintain that reduction for a short period of time. Agreed. Once upon a time, I was really, really big on the perfect neutral dorsiflexion ankle splint. And, uh, I don't know. The reality is they're in the splint for a couple days and then they get fixed early motion. I don't think they're going to get an equinus contracture from being in a suboptimal splint. It's, it's beautiful and wonderful and elegant if they're in a perfectly molded splint, but it's probably not the end of the world if they have a little plantar flexion, especially in the patient that you're talking about, Malcolm, because it's so common for large posterior mouths to continue to escape out the back that whatever you have to do to maintain the ankle reduced is okay with me. Same. I don't, uh, I don't even address it at this point, really. Any uh, good questions on the chat before we move on to a few more cases, Phil? Maybe in a few minutes, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to catch up here. We're getting, we're getting some nice ones coming in. So I'll do a couple live here in a second. All right. Perfect. Uh, so this first uh, case that we're going to jump into is a little bit of a different injury. This is a uh, male in their mid-30s who fell from the international border wall here in El Paso. Uh, they have these ankle x-rays here, which are a bit different from those other ankles we saw before. And you get a sense based on this comminution here that the injury is probably a bit different than those rotational ankles we saw before. Based on what we know about the mechanism too, we can assume uh, that these are, are injuries that occurred by sort of landing at and experiencing a big axial load. Uh, when your residents see these consults, what's different about uh, this injury for in, in your mind, Malcolm? Well, this, this is a totally different ball game in my mind. So this is a more of a higher energy um, injury with an axial load, a pilon fracture. So this is a can be a very bad soft tissue injury with the associated osseous component to it. So this is a length unstable fracture pattern um, that is going to need some type of um, provisional stabilization with surgery. Yeah, I mean, that's our strategy here, too. Uh, we uh, typically try to put on an external fixer to span the injury, get it out to length, restore that length alignment and rotational relationship, and then the patients uh, undergo surgery once the soft tissue is allowed. The other thing that's important in my mind is that you're going to span it, and then you scan it, you get your CT scan after to better understand that injury. And then thereafter, you, you're able to make a plan and fix the fractures once the soft tissues are amenable, because around the ankle, uh, it's, there's not a lot of wiggle room for those incisions. And very quickly, we can have bad wound issues. Uh, and then you're talking about infected uh, wounds with hardware exposed and fracture exposed, and it's just a recipe for disaster. So these are very different injuries. We could spend hours talking about them, but I just wanted to highlight it for you that these are different. We need to span, scan, and then fix after, but we have to be very, very thoughtful in how we do that. So this patient got both fixed um, and was non-weight bearing for an extended period of time. I think I kept him non-weight bearing for uh, 10 weeks um, before. Hey, Taylor, if I could just interrupt, if you go back one slide, these are such yeah. wonderful cases and there's so much to talk about. Now, there's a word that doesn't get discussed often, but ligamentotaxis. It's a big, long, fancy word, but it's so important. If you go back one more slide, these are really smashed ankles, and it's hard to even like discern what's broken, what's going on, what are we doing? You put them in a frame, you pull some traction, you let the ligaments do some work, you have ligamentotaxis, and all of a sudden, these look like ankles again. And they're much more manageable. So for the students that are logged on around the knee, around the ankle, this idea of ligamentotaxis, of just pulling some traction and let the intact soft tissues be your best friend, really is a magical, powerful tool. So ligamentotaxis. Plus, I like to say it. Thanks, Taylor. You bet. 
Do you have uh, any questions to run through, Phil, or you want to save them for the end real quick? We'll zoom through these last two and then hit the questions. Yeah, the only thing was weight bearing, uh, deciding weight bearing. I'm going to save that for the last case because I think it's a perfect case to talk about it. So, Perfect. And so we're we're running a bit short on time, so I'll run through this one real quick. This is a 42-year-old male. He twisted his ankle. It was seen in an outside hospital, put in a splint, and still he comes to the ER about a week later saying just has this sensation that it's sloppy and sloshing around. And the ankle feels unstable, but you see on his ankle film, there's not a fracture there. But some of those radiographic clues that we had before are abnormal here. And, and so this is just a case that illustrates how important it is to get the appropriate images. When you see this console in the ER, you can see there's a fibula fracture really, really high up. And so that indicates to us when there's a high fibula fracture and medial clear space widening and probably some increased widening of the uh, between the tibia and fibula there, that there's been a significant syndesmotic injury. When you guys treat these injuries, are you uh, trying to do a radiographic reduction of the syndesmosis, or do you do an open reduction? What's sort of the strategy there? Yeah, you know, these can be tough. Um, I think for me, I like to do open reduction and directly visualize the confluence of the fibula and the talus and the tibia. But I'm also using all of my clues, my radiographic clues. And if I have the luxury of getting an axial assessment of the reduction, I will definitely choose to do an intraoperative uh, spin prior to fixing. Hot topic yeah, so right here. But we could do an entire hour on the syndesmosis alone. So I'm all radiographic uh, um, and I, I, I'm not planning on changing. So I get contralateral films and uh, match but it. But these are your contralateral like films. <laughs> yeah, those are contralateral. So I, I feel like I'm good at that. I can match an ankle to the other side really well. I don't know if I'm as good visualizing it, but Baker, what do you do? Well, I'm just shaking my head because I've I've tried it and I've tried it and I've matched it like the perfect lateral and I don't know. I just it, it's uh, this is something everyone has their technique. So I don't. I'm not going to say that my way is the right way or your way. Or but we looked at our own surgical prowess in Houston and realized that uh, with the spin technology, sort of the intraoperative fluoroscopic CT scan, about 50% of the time, by our own admission, the reductions were way off using whatever means you wanted to use because the spin kind of gave the, the the true positive result. So I don't know. Now I'm back to just uh, doing a spin. If, if I have any question, pin it and spin it, adjust it, and then fix it. Not to mention, we could really get into some of the flexible fixation of the syndesmosis. And if you have, I don't know if you can see my camera, but the incisure, that's a little bit of a concavity and the fibula sits in it and maybe if you use flexible fixation rather than a screw mal reducing it anterior or posterior the flexible fixation such as a tightrope if you will might help it find its home or go to its home a bit more have you all found that the flexible fixation helps the fibula find its home in the incisure so this, I th that's why I showed this one. I think it's a really interesting example. I thought it would stimulate some good discussion, but but the contralateral films, he had a prior fracture, so that wasn't helpful. Uh, and then here I did, so I did do the open reduction and I pinned it, like you said, I didn't spin it, but I pinned it. Uh, and then I placed the, 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 syndesmo the flexible syndesmotic fixation because I am in that camp where I think, you know, that it centers it better. And then I, because it was, you know, I worry about that alone. So then I backed it up with a screw after I think theoretically this the flexible device has helped my reduction. So certainly potentially a, a controversial one, but I, love I think it. it looks looks great. Yeah, I agree. So the, the question I would have for you real quick is would you take the screw out eventually? Yeah, so I think um, that's where uh, Phil was talking about if they feel stiff later, uh, that maybe I would consider taking it out based on their stiffness uh, and if they're lacking in dorsiflexion primarily. Um, but it's not part of my practice to routinely take them out. I also, you know, I, in our system, it's just hard to do that too. 
Uh, so then uh, quickly, you want to run through this case, Phil? Yeah, I think this is a great one to finish up. And this x-ray right here looks somewhat similar to the first one that Malcolm showed, you know. It's a fibula fracture. It looks a little wide, medial. Maybe there's a little bit of translation of talus on the tibia. But, um, you know, if I was seeing this from far away, I wouldn't, it doesn't look that bad. So anyway, he got sent out in a boot um, and came back to clinic four weeks later. And so this is what can happen. I think back to your initial point, Taylor, don't underestimate him. This didn't get a stress exam. So we don't know the status of his ligament, his deltoid um, or any of the associated ligaments. And this was clearly much more unstable than that initial AP view showed. So um, this patient's a diabetic as well. And I, I think you really need to put these in a separate category because these patients can't feel. He was walking around with minimal pain on an ankle that's dislocated in a boot. So this is at four weeks. He gets a CT scan. I bring him in from clinic. He's about 380 uh, LBs. So he like Houston normal, you know. So, um, and then we we fixed it uh, the next day. And so to, to this point, I think, don't underestimate him. At four weeks out, he had thrown down a fair amount of uh, healing bone. And so we got his fibula back out to length and then did these multiple syndesmotic screws. This is a technique with diabetics that can be helpful. Again, to maintain, we, I want to maintain the ankle mortis so um, he um, doesn't re-dislocate, re-subluxate, and then we have problems in arthritis and infection and things. So from a weight-bearing standpoint, that was a great question. Somebody asked, in the diabetics, typically they get double the non-weight-bearing time. So this guy's going to be three months non-weight-bearing. For me, a syndesmosis injury is eight weeks. So two months non-weight-bearing, a simple ankle fracture is six weeks. So I, I don't know if uh, anyone else on the panel has a different protocol. Um, but No, this this looks fantastic. I agree with everything you said. I'm just wondering, is up at the proximal portion of the plate, is that the broken wire technique that you're using there? or uh... I like to put those at the top of all my uh, my diabetic ankles to know they're mine. You know, it's kind of like my signature. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I just Got break it. it off, you know? It's like a little treasure out there. Yeah. I knew he, I knew, he, he knew you'd point it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I I have a very uh, staunch. It's like you never lie and you never Photoshop fluoros ever. So we kept it in there. There you go. All right. Well, that was a lot to cover. So thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Don't forget to get your badge and to check out the video on YouTube if we're moving a little bit too fast for you. We got an excellent session next month. Uh, with uh, a good crew. You're getting upgraded uh, from me uh, to Augie, uh, and Jennifer's the uh, faculty, uh, the guest faculty for that week, and we're going to talk about upper extremity fractures uh, like this uh, wild ballistic humerus fracture that uh, Phil's going to walk you guys through. And then we wanted to make a quick announcement about a special session that we're hoping to hold for uh, for those who are gearing up and starting and or in the process of interviews, uh, we're going to hold a little forum uh, where we're going to discuss uh, interview tips and uh, interview pitfalls and maybe give you a little bit of advice. Um, anything you, you'd like to say about the, that session, Dr. Aker? Yeah, this is uh, an idea we've been kicking around for quite a while, and some of the MS4s are, you know, have gotten many interviews and probably have all already started the process. So I apologize that it's probably coming a few weeks too late, but this is the time that worked for all the staff and for all of us. But this would be a session that you probably don't want to miss if you are an MS4 and you're actively in uh, interviews right now on the circuit, uh, because we're going to have some junior folks, some senior folks, and uh, some potential pitfalls and some traps you can fall into. But more importantly, ways to make yourself shine like Malcolm was talking about earlier. So I really look forward to it. So uh, everybody's going to get a link. Uh, don't just assume you're automatically registered. Check your email for these links. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in a few weeks. Look forward to it.